السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له أشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وخليله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الله به الغمة وجاهد في سبيل ربه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم ارزيه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وتوفنا على ملته وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظم بعدها أبدا ثم أما بعد My dear respected brothers and sisters عيد مبارك to all of you May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all our ibadah during the month of Ramadan and May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestow his mercy upon all of us and protect and bless all of our families One of the great and amazing benefits of the month of Ramadan is that it unites the Muslim Ummah despite, despite its profound diversity and it helps us affirm our identity, the Muslim identity. And talking about the Muslim identity, individuals, communities, and even nations, they always try to re-ask themselves this question, who are we? And I think as Samuel, Samuel Huntington wrote his book in 2005, who are we that challenges to America's national identity, where he focused on the identity crisis um, as he examined the influence of the different civilizations and cultures on the American identity. But he felt that the American identity is threatened. And I strongly believe that we American Muslims also need to ask this question to ourselves, who are we? And this question is important for a number of reasons. One is that we, or at least many of us, do have an identity crisis. We are not very clear about who we are. And what's even worse is that sometimes we are in a state of denial and we allow others to identify us American Muslims. Also, this crisis is reflected in our activities, in our behavior, in our um, the way we manage our organizations and the kind of plans we have for the future. And finally, it's important for us to ask ourselves this question because in order for us American Muslims to be able to overcome the so many challenges that we face, we have to first be clear about who we are. We are the most diverse religious group in the United States, according to Gallup study on American Muslims. But we also know that we, American Muslims, we have multiple identities. The culture of, of origin, for those of us who are immigrants, and the Islamic tradition, Islamic identity, and also the American culture or the American identity or citizenship. And sometimes we focus on one of these identities over the other. And we have, of course, so many other sub-identities. If you are from India, then you are from this particular part of India, or from Hyderabad, or from Punjab. If you are from Pakistan, you are either from Karachi, or from Kashmir, or, or either you are from Bangladesh. If you are the, from the Middle East, you are either from Palestine, Jordan, Egypt, or Algeria. If you are from African descent, then you are either coming from Kenya or Nigeria or South Africa and so on and so forth. But what makes us all here today, despite of all this diversity, is that because we are Muslims and number two, because we are Americans. And many Muslims do not realize that a new American Muslim culture synthesized from the cultures of origin, Islamic tradition and the American context, American reality, American culture is emerging and we are producing this American Muslim culture. Everything we do, the way we celebrate Ramadan and Eid, Laylatul Qadr, the way we do Khatm al-Quran, the way we run our organizations, the way we um, manage our um, Islamic schools or the weekend schools or whatever educational institutions we have, we are knowingly or non unknowingly, we are producing this culture. So when our children grow up here, 
are not very much attached to any other culture but the American Muslim culture, they will find the normal American Muslim culture that we produced for them. And when the turn, their turn comes, then they will produce also, continue to produce the American Muslim culture for the next generation. So it's very crucial for us um, Americans to um, realize or ask ourselves, who are we? Muslims, of course, American Muslims are not required at all. I'm not suggesting that we should abandon or deny uh, our culture of origin uh, because number one, we cannot do that. Number two, we're not required to do that. It's not good for us. It's not good for America. It's not good for Islam. But importantly, we need to understand that the cultural practice of Islam can and should be adjust to fit with this new American Muslim culture. Sometimes we are afraid to claim or to believe or to um, identify ourselves as Americans because we have this um, understanding or some of us have this perception that everything that's American is by default un-Islamic and which is not true. What's unique about Islam is that it's a universal message that can fit any culture and any social structure. This is what's unique about Islam. Islam is, is amazing. Look at Ramadan and how Muslims celebrate Ramadan and that kind of tradition they develop within their culture. The 29th night, two nights uh, ago, I decided to visit other masajid because I was very busy here the whole month. So I was free because we have a guest speaker and someone to lead the ta uh, taraweeh. And I did uh, taraweeh in Ayona and did another Khatm al-Quran, uh, sorry, in Unit Center and then in Ayona, in addition to my knowledge of my own community. And just in this very small radius, with three beautiful Muslim communities, we have differences. They do things, almost the same things, but in a different way. And you can see the cultural spin taking place during these activities. Different ways of doing things and different ways of celebrating Eid. And we should appreciate and be proud of our culture of origin. We should and must be proud of being Muslims, but we cannot deny Sometimes we don't say it, but we behave sometimes as if we think American um, values and Islamic values cannot be um, uh, reconciled. They are totally different things. And as for, uh, for, for the challenge that we face, we have both internal and external challenges. I don't have to talk so much about the external challenges that we all Muslims have or face, Islamophobia. Uh, being a minority, uh, you know, many of us came from Muslim majority countries, facing so many dif different socio-economical, political, and legal systems. Um, just to give you a, an example of the June 26th Supreme Court decision and how much it will impact us and our children when the same-sex marriage becomes the norm. It's normal. You have to realize this. If you build an Islamic school and people apply, then you cannot say no to someone because of sexual orientation. You cannot fire. If you have business, you cannot say no. Bakery business, the example is giving all the time. You cannot say no. Otherwise, you are discriminating against people. Huge impact and ramifications and consequences to this Supreme Court decision in June 26th. We remember this day for generations to come. So many um, ramifications that will affect us and our children. It seems to me that we are not addressing any of these things. Or maybe some of us speak or write an article here and there, but we American Muslims, sometimes we think this is not our issue. It's not our issue. It's the American issue. We're well, Muslim, alhamdulillah, we're not going to be affected by this. Wrong. That's not the case. But we will not be able to challenge or to face or to overcome these challenges until we have or we at least try to solve or overcome our internal problem. That's not coming from outside, it's coming from within. Problems coming from within. 
One of these you know, major internal challenges is our diversity, which could be a challenge, it could be also a great opportunity. I personally learned so many things about so many other countries and cultures and madahib and way of doing things when I came to the States. It's a great opportunity to learn and to appreciate and to tolerate other pe people's cultures and backgrounds and the way you do things. We do follow many different sects. In addition to our diver, uh, racial and, um, and ethnic diversity, we have also religious affiliation diversity. You are affiliated to different sects and schools of thoughts and ideologies and uh, movements. Our Sunnis and Shias and Sufi and members of um, sectarian groups and religious and secular people and people are not affiliated with any group or any agenda at all. And one of the challenges that we have internally is how can we, I wouldn't say overcome, but how can we turn this diversity from being a challenge into being a great opportunity to enrich our community and to be proud of our unique diversity. One of the internal conflicts or challenge that we have is the diversity between the immigrants, the new immigrants, and the American-born Muslims. That includes indigenous African-American, um, Native Americans, converts, versus immigrants, and the new immigrants. We have different interests. Every, every one of these groups, they have different interests. So what's, what's, what's our united interest? What interest all of us, the newcomers, the old um, immigrants, and the indigenous and American born, including the second generation. It seems that instead of training the new immigrants to fit within the American Muslim culture, we are doing the opposite. We are forcing somehow the American born second, third generations who have no culture about the American Muslim culture to follow what I would call the, the, a particular place's culture, not the Islamic culture. We have to differentiate between what's Islamic and what's Muslim. But usually, we have this you know, dynamic going on between the new immigrants who try to create a new um, India or new Pakistan or new Middle East or new Africa here in America without realizing the profound nuances and the differences between one culture and the other. And consequently, we also have this conflict between the so conservative, ultra-conservative Muslims and the ultra-liberal Muslims and so many in between. I would argue that the mass majority of American Muslims are mainstream, moderate, Muslims who don't have any, one extreme ideas or others. Some are very liberal and others are very conservative. But what happens is that we, most of the time, we submit to the will of the very conservatives. Why? Because they have the religious authority, or so they claim. So the religious authority must come from outside. We have questions and then we phone someone, you know, in the other half of the globe to get fatwa from there. Someone does not know anything about our reality. In our Islamic tradition, the ulama and the fuqaha, when someone comes from out of the, of the town, this scholar in, and come and ask him a question, said, I don't know, go and ask someone local, because I don't know your custom, I don't know your culture, I don't know your tradition. Don't ask me, I have no idea. And all Muslim scholars, scholars of Islamic law, or Islamic legal theory, they agree that the urf or the custom or the culture plays a significant role in making law. So once you have the religious authority, then, then everybody has to submit because you cannot argue against God. And if you speak on behalf of God, then khalas, you don't argue, you submit. We love to submit. Islam is submission. And this is very, this, this, this uh, uh, 
situation we're in is reflected on the kind of things that concerns us. What concerns us is totally different from what concerns our children and their children later on. We debate which grocery store has halal meat and which does not have halal meat. And then we have to ask someone to verify this for us. Should we pray which this way or that way? 20 rakah or 8 rakahs? Our children and the, new, the American born, indigenous Americans and African Americans, they're not really concerned so much about this, as if this is the end of the world. If you pray witch in a different way, then your Islam is, would collapse. You get out of Islam. And this shows how much the immigrant's way of thinking is overwhelming. And pushing all of us to waste our energy and our resources in these silly debates. We talk so much about halal and hilal, but nobody's really interested in discussing the Supreme Court decision. No one's concerned about this. We are instead of denial, as if this is something that happened to bad people, not to good, us good people. We always focus on the strict fatwas that keep us always in the safe side. No, brother, I want to be in the safe side. I want to be in the safe side. So where would be the safe side? And dealing with banks and having a bank account and buying insurance. Where is the safe side if you, your, your son graduated from law school studying non-Muslim law or non-Islamic law? What is the safe side if you have to work in a bank or you have to work in the Pentagon or you have to be a movie producer? Where is the safe side if you go to any mall? Where is the safe side when you send your children to public school? If you really want to be in the safe side, go back where you came from. And I'm not suggesting here that we should not be, try to be in the safe side. We should. But the safe side varies from one person to the other. Yes, Islam said these things are haram, but in the state of necessity, then you can, you can do it. Allah repeatedly in the Quran says, you cannot eat pork, you cannot eat dead animals, but unless there is necessity, you're going to die, then you can eat it. And that's the exception. Of course, you cannot spend years and years eating pork or because it is necessity. We cannot construct our culture, American Muslim culture, based on the exception of necessity. Everything is necessity. So why are you here, brother? Oh, I'm here to spread Islam, spread Dawah. Yeah, but do you have a bank account? Yes, I have a bank. Do you have a credit card? Yes, I do have a credit card. It's a necessity. Right? You pay taxes? Yeah, I have to. It's a necessity. You send your kids to public school? Yeah, it's a necessity. So We cannot turn our entire life into a necessity, as if we are living here temporarily. And someday, somehow, all these necessities will change, and therefore we'll go back to our normal Islamic um, situation. That is not the case. Yes, of course, we, the concept of necess necessity in Islam is there, but we cannot, we cannot just rely on um, some so-called scholars who know the text of the madrasa they studied in, but they have no idea what's going on beyond the walls of the masjid. And someone asked me when I was applying for my PhD studies, Imam, you know everything. Why do you have to do a PhD? And I told him that, who told you I know everything? This idea is wrong. Nobody knows everything. What we know is very little. Even in Islamic knowledge, very little. And we're trying just to make sense of Islam and make sense of the world in which we are living. Yes, I, 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 I intentionally, this was my jihad. I thought this is my jihad. The knowledge I got from the schools and the great schools I learned from back in Egypt is not sufficient to solve or to deal with the issues of American Muslims. You get, have to get out of the masjid. Alhamdulillah, it helped significantly. I hope. And the more you get to know other cultures, more people, more writings, not, more ideas and thoughts and philosophies, the more you know yourself. And you're able to identify yourself proudly as Muslim. And I feel comfortable talking to anybody. 
my, if my neighbor is an atheist or a co-worker is a um, fanatic religious person, then I, I, would, I have no problem to befriend them, but in the same time, I'm, I disagree with you because here is my um, arguments. We need to learn. We need to know our reality. But it seems to me, again, because this idea that to be a good Muslim in America, you have to be extra conservative to protect your identity. And this fear of others push us to take the other extreme. Muslims in the time of the golden age when they built a huge, wonderful civilization, they were not afraid of anybody. They were translating the books of others. And the time of Harun al-Rashid and his son and Ma'mun, they were rewarding the, the scholars and the younger scholars, those who translate books from Greek and Persian and other languages to Islam, including philosophy and so on. We're not scared of others. We lived in Spain for eight centuries, interacting with all cultures, all philosophies, all ideas, all religions. Because we're proud of our deen and we know how to defend it intellectually. It's a, an interesting, amazing phenomenon that we, in our educational um, programs, whether it's a weekend school, Islamic school, we are always focusing on how we look, how we appear. As if there's an Islamic appearance and non-Islamic appearance. Brothers, you look good. You look beautiful, whether you're wearing traditional, um, modern jeans, suits, dishdasha, shirwal kameez, you look good. You look Muslim and you look American. This is part of American mosaic and multiculturalism. We should be proud of our origin, our religion. We should also be proud of being Americans. But another amazing phenomenon, I'll end with this, I know I don't want to make it very long, that as individuals, most of us are very successful in their you know, studies, in their work, in their career, we're doing very well. Because we're more Americans when we study. And we're more Americans when we interact with other people. In the workplace, you work with all kinds of people. You know, Asians, Africans, Europeans, white, black, Latinos, religious and non-religious, believers and non-believers. You have no issue. You have a project, you work with all these people, and you're successful. Statistics suggest that Muslims are, in general, highly educated, and they have a moderate income. But when it comes to working together, Sometimes, look at any, you name any Islamic organization that comes to your mind. Lots of conflicts and disagreements and things, you know, are not going well. Why? Because we are less Americans. We don't have a system. We are less Americans and less professional. If we run our Islamic organization the way we run our own business, in a professional way, we don't have, have any of these troubles and conflicts and wasting of time and money and resources. So we are Americans, we are Muslims, and we should be proud of this. In one of the meetings of um, the Imams, um, we, were, we have these diverse uh, Imams, or Sunnis and Shias, and, and Imams who follow different Madahi, but we have, alhamdulillah, very successful monthly meeting in the Imams Council in Michigan. Uh, we're proud of that. And one of, in one of the events, um, in, when there's a uh, you know, debate or conflict between Sunnis and Shias in Iraq and in Syria and Iran and Saudi Arabia, all these discussions, I, I made the statement when I said that we are here today, Imams, coming from different backgrounds, Sunnis and Shias, and thanks to the American system. And some, of course, did not like this. I made the point that if we were Iraqi or Syrian citizens, we have been you know, killing each other not sitting on the same table discussing and eating um, sandwiches and drinking coffee. We are here together sitting and talking because we are living in the United States. I'm not suggesting that everything is perfect in America, but at least there is a system. We know the system, we go through the system, we produce in the system, we succeed in the system as individuals. And we need to do the same when we come together and do something together. Brothers and sisters, we need to ask these questions. Who are we? What's our vision? What are our goals? What is our short and long-term plan? What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? And how can we overcome these challenges? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was the most successful man in human history. 
This is what Muslims and non-Muslim objective um, scholars wrote. It was the most successful one. Only in 23 years he achieved all this. Because if you study the seal of the Prophet, you'll find out that his vision was extremely clear. Quran talked about it, he emphasized it. This is your goal. This is your vision. To see the world full of light. Light of justice and tawheed. This is his vision. To invite people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he had clear goals he wants to achieve. And he planned very well. As Sheikh Muhammad al-Ghazali says, when you study the, the, the hijrah of the Prophet from Mecca and Medina, you feel that he planned as if he has no tawakkul, and he makes tawakkul on Allah as if he does not plan. He has extremely well-balanced view of how to do things. And he identified the challenges, so many challenges, internal, you have the Sahaba coming from different backgrounds, and you have to unite them and build them and educate them and change them from jahiliya to Islam. That's in of itself is a huge challenge. And the external challenge but he put them in priority he did not deal with the, his enemies among the people of the book first he did not start by the byzantines the greatest enemy for him was his own people he had to deal with them using all peaceful diplomatic ways to solve these conflicts and if nothing worked then he has to fight he had to and he dealt with these challenges one after the other and in the end of his life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he gave this beautiful khutbah in his final hajj, there were 100,000 people around him, start by himself, in 23 years only. Clear vision, well planned, identifying challenges and dealing with them. What are our challenges? What are our priorities as American Muslim? I would argue, I would end with this, it is almost a sin or even a crime for someone to take any leadership position in any Islamic or Muslim community or Islamic organization without being able to answer these simple questions. Who are we? What are our goals, our objectives? What are the challenges, the opportunities? What's our plan? Our priorities should reflect our identity. When we say youth first, education first, this reflects who we are. Not how we look. How we look does not matter really. I was asking myself this question when, when we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Ramadan. How does this benefit Islam? It benefits me. I pray. I fast. I get a lot of reward inshallah and my sins hopefully will be forgiven. That's good for me. How is this good for America? How is this good for Islam in America? What kind of contribution we are adding to the American culture and American society? We'll be able to answer this question when we are able to answer the simple question, who are we? Finally, brothers and sisters, I'll just emphasize the fact that we are producing. Every one of us, by being here, you are affirming this American Muslim culture. The way we look, the way we pray, the way we come together, this is American Muslim. But this culture needs to be revisited and re-evaluated. And we need to keep in mind, whatever good or bad, we are doing today is building this structure that our children will inherit. So what kind of future, what kind of culture we want to pass to our children? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to be able to answer these questions, to forgive all of our sins and to have mercy on all of us and to accept from all of us. الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالم إنك حميد مجيد brothers and sisters today we have two wonderful eids عيد الفطر um, and the day of Jum'ah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our dua in this blessed day, in this blessed hour, in this blessed um, uh, masjid. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from all of us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our shortcomings. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to enjoy so many Ramadans to come. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, for our brothers and sisters 
who are not here with us today because they are sick, they are in the hospital, or they are um, in their homes, they could not make it, to please grant them quick and complete recovery. And our brothers and sisters who are in debt, Ya Allah, please help them to pay off their debts. And our brothers and sisters who are going through hardship, help them to overcome their hardship. Ya Allah, please, as you gathered us, all of us come from different backgrounds here in this place for no reason but to worship you and to serve you. We ask you, Allah, to gather us all in Jannat and Naeem with our parents, our brothers and sisters, spouses and children, all our relatives and friends, our scholars and our ulama. Please gather us all with our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rabbana la tu'akhibna inna sina wa akhta'na. Rabbana wa la tahmil alayna isran kama hamaltahu ala alladhina min qablina. Rabbana wa la tuhamilna ma la taqata lana bih. Wa'afu anna wa ghfil lana wa rahamna. Anta mawlana fansurna ala qawm al-kafirin. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Al-Eid Mubarak to all of you.